Hello and welcome to Deep Blue Sea, the podcast. I'm your host, Jay Clue. On this show, we've been through the entire Deep Blue Sea trilogy scene by scene. Now looking at some Deep Blue Sea adjacent films. That's films directed by Rennie Harlan, featuring sharks or aquatic action. And uh, once again, we have a lot of aquatic action. A little sprinkling of sharks, no Rennie Harlan. It's just today we're talking about Hello Down There. What is Hello Down There? Great question. It's a 1969 American film uh, directed by Jack Arnold, starring Tony Randall, Janet Lee, Jim Backus. Uh, Ken Berry, Roddy McDowell, Richard Dreyfus, a bunch of other people, Mel Griffin. Uh, it, it tells the story of a uh, inventor, architect guy uh, called Fred, played by Tony Randall, who has created a, a, an underwater house to live in, and for it to be proven worthy of carrying on existing, he volunteers himself and his family, including his waterphobic wife, uh, Janet Lee. Uh, to go and live there for a month. And it turns out that his kids are in a band, so their bandmates come along as well, and hilarity ensues. Uh, so I need to guess how we talk about this uh, this forgotten film. Uh, so Todd Gleibenau from Forgotten Film Cars is here. Welcome back, Todd. Hey, great to be here. So you might be thinking, Todd's on. This must mean it's a, a poorly reviewed sequel starring Michael Caine, uh, which is not the case. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that would have been your third one, uh, if, if that was the, if it were, but it's not. No one can be found in here. Sadly, uh, I don't know. Uh, but Todd, welcome back. Thrilled to have you back here. Uh, this is a, a very special show. This is a uh, cross-promotion show because uh, I, mere moments ago, I uh, was recording an episode with Todd for the Forgotten Filmcast on this film, Hello Down There. And prior to that, we I had the thought like, hey, this is a very Deep Blue Sea adjacent film. That I feel like yep. the DBC listeners should listen to as well. They'll hear us talk about as well. So we're actually going to uh, release the feature discussion, feature discussion section from the Forgotten Filmcast in this very episode with a different intro that you're hearing right now and an outro that you'll be hearing after that feature discussion. Uh, so Todd and I have already talked about this film. We had a great time. It's a great film. I recommend. <laughs> we <you>. did. <laughs> uh, and so you know, we, we're, gonna, we're not going to hide it from you any longer. Uh, you're about to listen to Todd and I talk about Hello Down There. I remember Todd hosted this, so it's actually very, it's much better researched and better hosted than regular. So enjoy. Oh, come on, Jay. Give yourself some credit. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get on to this movie here, which I, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, has uh, deep and blue elements to it here. Uh, this is called Hello Down There from 1969. It's directed by Jack Arnold director of many films for you know basically a 30-year time span between 1950 and 1980 most known for some classic 50 sci-fi films uh things like it came from outer space the incredible shrinking man the space children but most famously creature from the black lagoon and its oh, first yeah. sequel revenge of the creature now this film centers on a guy named fred miller played by tony randall he works for a underwater development company of some sort and basically the the company has sunk tons of money into the construction of a house uh like an underwater house of the future type thing uh, tony randall's character is basically like yeah we we need uh, we're gonna run out of space up here on the surface someday so we need to start planning for people to live underwater this is much to sh the chagrin of his boss, T.R. Hollister, played by Jim Backus. He wants to scrap the project and destroy the house, but Miller is convinced that he can prove that this is a great thing by having a family live in the house for 30 days. And, of course, the family he has in mind is his own. But there are going to be some challenges with this, primarily because his wife, Vivian, played by Janet Lee, is afraid of water. So, of course... Oh. Living underwater, not a good thing. I, maybe she had a bad experience in the shower once or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just waiting for that opportunity, Jay. I'm glad you laughed. <laughs> <laughs> then we also have, uh, he's got some teenage kids, okay? We've got Tommy, played by Gary Tigerman, and Lori, played by Kay Cole. They are part of an up-and-coming rock band called Harold and the Hang-Ups. And the Herald, uh, who leads this band, is played by a young actor named Richard Dreyfus. Now, <laughs> the kids, they don't want to go live underwater because, you know, the, the band is on the verge of a, a big record contract. There's this quirky producer named Nate Ashbury, played by Roddy McDowell, who has an interest in them. And, you know, 
if they go live underwater, that's going to going to mess things up. So they actually decide that they are going to go along with this undersea adventure, but only if the rest of the band can go with them. And so parents are like, all right, whatever, you know, it, it, it's perfect acoustics down there. You know, you can practice to your heart's content, whatever. So this whole crew gets in the mini sub, heads underwater and goes to live in this this house of the future. Now, the the house has many new modern conveniences, not to mention that there's a pair of guard dog like dolphins named Duke and Duchess and a friendly seal uh, who likes to watch the laundry machine named Gladys. Now, life, though, as I'm sure you can uh, understand, is not perfect under the water. There are many challenges. This includes the occasional visit from some nasty sharks, a hurricane that's brewing above the surface, and a rival co-worker of Miller's, played by Ken Berry, who is mining the bottom of the ocean for gold. Uh, and also there is the confused military, who thinks that the signals they are picking up from the house must be from some kind of enemy weapon. And then there is also the fact that Harold and the Hangups are offered a chance to appear on the Merv Griffin show, but are stuck underwater. <laughs> So uh, a lot going on in this weird little little movie. There's a lot of familiar faces in this. Uh, In addition to the ones I've already mentioned, we've got folks like Charlotte Ray, Lee Meredith, Arnold Stang, Harvey Lembeck, and Merv Griffin himself putting in a cameo at the end of the film. We've got lots of weird 60s pop music going on, a bunch of underwater diving sequences, which were directed by Rico Browning, who's most famous as the guy who actually played the Gill Man in the underwater scenes of Creature from the Black Lagoon. So, yeah, a lot going on, a lot of deep blue sea action. So I'm going to let Jay get us started here. Give us a few of your thoughts on Hello Down There. I I, I had a lot of fun with this one. Uh, So, as I mentioned earlier, I've heard of this before, Uh, I... I'm less familiar with most of the cast than uh, you or many of your listeners, probably, just given uh, my age and country of origin. Tony Randall, not someone I'm that familiar with. Uh, <laughs> Merv Griffin, not someone I'm that familiar with. Um, but, uh, it's, like, it's, only, it's only really like Janet Lee, Roddy McDowell, Richard Dreyfus are the three. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you and you and you. Okay, great. Uh-huh. You'll never work with sharks again. And, <laughs> and, um, uh, but I I really liked this film. I had a lot of fun. I, I was like watching the whole thing. I was like, this, why is this? Because this is great. I, I mean, this is like so entertaining. Why why didn't this catch on? And then it's because it doesn't have an ending. There's no end to this film. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's a big climatic scene set up. And then oh, credits are here. Great. So I feel like uh, these days it would get a low cinema score, uh, just from people going like, what what happened? It's just where's the final scene? Because uh, mm-hmm. it's it's kind of building up to this big. Uh, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation kind of ending with uh, the SWAT team is all breaking into the Christmas ha- the Crystal's house. You think we're going to get that scene where the army will, will, or the navy breaks in and, and you just don't. And it's, it's stuff like right before this is about to happen. So that was frustrating. Uh, but like, the whole way through, this to me felt like a, a feature length sitcom pilot. Yes. From the 60s, it, it feels like a I Dream of Genie kind of thing, a bewitched, where like, what, what if you were married to a witch? No, what if you lived underwater? Like, and, and all of the antics I would watch that show. Uh, all of the antics that happen, they're all they're all kind of mild sitcom kind of stuff. What what if there's a team sabotaging you? Where the only thing that happens when they sabotage you is the floor pitches a little bit, and then the dad comes back and rectifies it. So there's some antics with a stapler falling off a table, and oh, the washing machine explodes, but in a way that no washing machine would ever explode. <laughs> like, it's, gonna, it's gonna throw some underwear onto Janet Lee's face. Uh, like that, that's, that's the worst thing that's going to happen. But it, and like, the, the fact that there's just a band constantly playing throughout is it, very the young ones. And just, there's a band playing in the living room. Not, none of the science makes sense. Like the the opening shot of the film is two guys in a, in a two man submarine wearing full business suits. <laughs> <laughs> just just that, just that image of like, wait, wait a minute, that's not what you'd be wearing. And like at, at one point, Tony Randall has to go diving to face the sharks, and he does so dressed in his everyday clothes just with a, yeah. a, a face mask on right J- just throw on the air tank the face mask yeah and you're good to go <laughs> he has no weaponry but he confronts the sharks he has like a diversionary device that's going to attract him somewhere else but he and a couple of dolphins defeat this like gang of sharks that's just shown up uh so it's it's silly uh it's not as silly as some of the films we covered on dbc uh but it's it's entertaining and i i enjoyed myself greatly yeah 
I, silly is a good word. I, it's a very strange movie. I, I can't say it's terribly good, but I was entertained. And I think for some of the reasons you said there, I did definitely have that kind of 60s era sitcom feel to it. And I mean, I was raised on that stuff. I was a kid in the 70s. That stuff was all playing in reruns. So I dream of Gene E. Bewitched, all that kind of stuff. That that made up my day. I guess we should start by saying that this is definitely not as meant to be anything outrageous or edgy or anything like that. I mean, this is a family film. It was created as a family film. Uh, in fact, they re-released it again in 1974. Paramount was doing this kind of family matinee series, and, and they released it as a part of that. I think they even changed the title when they re-released it to sub a dub dub But, uh, you know, it, it's going to be you know, very much geared towards a family audience. And a lot of the humor is stuff that, you know, kids are probably going to find funny. The adults may have rolled their eyes at a bit. Uh, I mean, it's very much in the style of like Disney live action films from this era. It really kind of feels like they're trying to emulate that feel, which is strange because I can't really think of any other films that try to emulate that Disney live action style because 60s and 70s Disney live action films are generally not considered to be very good. <laughs> so... You have the likes of uh, like Mary Poppins, Shishi Bang Bang. They're from that era, but this is more brightly colored than all of those, uh, I think. Like I, I, I love the set. Uh, the, the colors oh, yeah, of the whole thing, yeah. they, they really pop. It's, it, everything's so brightly colored. It's like w w it, when they're in uh, Nate Ashbury's office and he's got his, there's uh, Dr. Wells, the Meredith character, when she's uh, like, at the computer. But the, there, is, there is no outfit pinker than what she is wearing. Like, <laughs> yeah. Barbie would shy away from looking at that coat she has on. It's, it's like, it hurts the eyes. Oh, yeah. No, the look of the film is is wild. And I'm not talking about in terms of like cinematography or, or anything like that. The <laughs> cinematography is very much, again, TV style. But the look of everything in the film is crazy. I mean, like say the clothing, very bright, strange patterns. I mean, it, it was great. Janet Lee in a few scenes here is wearing some really wild pattern type stuff. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm not used to seeing Janet Lee uh, in clothes like that. And then, yeah, just the look of the, the house in general, lots of bright colors, lots of, you know, weird things around that you're going, okay, I don't know what that is, what that's supposed to do. It's supposed to be something science-y. It looks cool. I mean, it looks like Epcot, <laughs> you know? Yes, yes. The world of tomorrow. And yeah, that's the thing. I mean, it looks like Epcot or probably even more accurately like Tomorrowland at Disneyland when they built it in 1955, trying to guess what the future of 1995 would look like. It's just that kind of cool retro future type of a vibe to things and that was probably one of the things i liked about the film the most because yeah there's a lot of stuff about this that you go well this is silly and you're kind of ra rolling your eyes but kind of that cool retro futuristic feel to things i, I thought was fun i i completely agree yeah the I, I feel like if this was made today the underwater house would be a lot more lavish than just one big living area and then a couple of bedrooms uh, <laughs> but it's it's very simple it's a simple set there's a big open pool in the middle which has real deep blue sea vibes. I was expecting Sam oh, yeah. Jackson to make a speech on the side of that. Um, <laughs> well, it didn't happen. It's sad to say. Uh, but like the the newfangled, the first thing that uh, that Fred shows uh, Vivian, his wife, is her new kitchen. Yes, uh, it's, it's very sixties as well. Like, this is your new kitchen. This is your new fridge. It's in the counter. This is your new dishwasher. It's in the counter. This is your new washing machine. This is every woman's dream. He, I think he says something along those lines. Yeah. Your new hot plate. This is your new garbage disposal. And like, later in the film, the the house is being cleaned by Vivian and Laurie. No one else. Oh, what are we cleaning next? The boys' bedroom. So, well, the boys should clean their bedroom. <laughs> 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 what are they doing right now? Nothing. There is no, they just we sat down writing a song or something. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's very, very sixties. A lot of a lot of eye rolls from my wife I was watching. This. <laughs> <laughs> justified, totally justified. I love that stuff though. Just you know, kind of the gimmicky nature of of you know the fridge that pops out of the counter and and all that stuff. You know, the weird idea of what in 1969 they thought the future was going to be like it's charming and it's fun to watch it and, and look at, wow, look how wrong they were. You know, it's like watching back to the future part two, you know, but it, it's not even set in the future. I think this is, this is supposed to be contemporary. 
Right, uh, yeah. This is, <laughs> hey, this, we, it's 1969. We built a house underwater. This is what we've done. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is what it would be. And uh, yeah, it, I mean, the, the whole premise is uh, in the future, there's going to be so little land or so many people, everyone's going to have one square foot each to live on. So what we need to do, go underwater. Like, how can you ignore 71% of the Earth's surface? Can I, I wish... I like the premise. I like the. You and I have talked about sometimes uh, these kinds of films can be overly preachy before. Uh, I love Wally. You like Wally less than I do uh, mm-hmm. because you think it's too preachy. Uh, I think that this better handles that, where it's that set, that premise of like the world's doomed and then they don't talk about it again. They just set it up and then they move <laughs> on. Uh, so that's something to appreciate, I guess. But you know, they, they don't aren't exactly doing much to really help the situation in terms of like, if they're concerned about the environment, you know, the whole garbage disposal system, which is what attracts the sharks in the first place <laughs> yes. is a little off. I mean, the problem is that, you know, she accidentally pushes the button that shoots the garbage out of the, of the, uh, the green onion. That's what they call the, the underwater yep. house, the green onion. It shoots the garbage out. And so then the, the sharks are attracted to that somehow and they go attack it. And, you know, it's because she didn't incinerate it first. She's supposed to incinerate before they eject. But I'm like, you're still ejecting crap out into the ocean. So what, how is that helping things? It, it's baby steps. Like they, they say like all of the energy, <laughs> everything, everything comes from the water. So that's great. They don't tell you how. They don't explain that. They say, hey, everything comes from the water. It's like, great, well done. Uh, but yeah, the, we're still chucking stuff in there, uh, which is only going to make the ocean deeper. <laughs> and make less and less land. Uh, so, yeah, but one thing at a time, I guess. Um, yeah, she's distracted by the band playing another song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it, and those sharks are immediately there. They're, it's not like she puts out there and, and there's a little hanging around. No, the sharks are the, there. They are waiting for this rubbish to be to be ejected. It's, it's, it's silly. I like it. I'm not going to well, complain about any of this. I had a lot of fun. Well, let's talk about the sharks then. I mean, you know, you, you have a podcast that's all about shark movies and things like that so uh you know how, how do you rate our shark action here well, i was thrilled when there was some i i went in not knowing there would be sharks and there were sharks and i was so happy i think that that was the point where i messaged you like we should cover this on deeper sea like, this, isn't, <laughs> this isn't just for your show it's just my show too um, <laughs> it's fine a lot a, a lot of the uh undersea creature footage is just like b-roll i think or just kind of they're just filming people hanging around so that right. there are some scenes with the when the band are playing and they cut to like the animals are dancing where there's like a three second clip of a turtle. They just play and then reverse it and then play and reverse it. So it's like he's dancing. Yeah. It's like under the sea. <laughs> it's like, it's exactly like under the sea. Uh, so a lot of the shark footage is the same where it's just, Hey, let's film some sharks swimming around. Which 1969, it's, there's no CGI in this. It's just filming sharks. That's what you're going to get. But when they have the fight sequence, where they have dolphins fighting sharks. Like, yes. Yes. That's incredible. <laughs> like, that they, was that was great. Because <laughs> um, they have this, there's like a balloon they can release that's got a chemical in it that will attract sharks somewhere else. They release one, and it pops too early, and it covers the house in this stuff, so all the sharks get attracted back to the house. Uh, so they do another one where so Tony Rando has to swim away, swim away, and release the balloon somewhere else. Uh, so and that, that, that's when he's fighting the sharks. Uh, so the dolphins just come out of nowhere and help him, and it's very well edited nature footage. I think of it, it tells a good story. They managed to compare like, hey, the dolphins arrive, the dolphins fight the sharks, the sharks go away, the dolphins fight. Like we get all of that just from like undirected footage. You can't tell a dolphin to go and attack a shark. It's, what? It's not, it's not <laughs> how it works. Can't do that. So, so but, I, I'm impressed with how they do. It. I don't want to know if they did do that, like how they managed to coax these kind of things happen. I want to know. I just appreciate how they what the result they got. Well, it actually looks like they did do it. I mean, I and <laughs> I'm no dolphin or shark expert here, but I actually for another project I was doing a year or so ago had to do some research on dolphins and saw that there are certainly cases where dolphins have protected swimmers or other dolphins from sharks and they will ram them and things like that. And you actually see that happen in this. You see a dolphin come and, and rams its nose into the shark and the shark swims off and they add a nice little thunk sound effect yeah. when the dolphin <laughs> rams into them. But I, you know, I watched it a couple times and I was like, that looks legit. That looks like that's a real dolphin hitting a shark. And I, I, I think it was. So, you know, that, that was kind of cool to see. And then of course, the the icing on the cake of the whole thing is you mentioned Tony Randall has to go out there and swim around and release these balloons manually or whatever it is. 
And, um, you know, I, I'm 100 percent sure that's not Tony Randall out there actually scuba sure. diving. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's Rico Browning, uh, because as I was watching the way he swam and stuff, I was going the way his legs are moving looks just like the Gill Man. I'm pretty sure that's that's got to be him. But there's like one shot where a shark is swimming over him and he kicks him. I mean, he lifts up his flipper foot and just kicks the shark in the stomach and the shark swims off. And I was like, all right, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I, I didn't notice if there was a bit in the in the credits were like no animals were harmed in the making of this film. I didn't look for that. Yeah, I didn't see that. they didn't do that. I guess that's probably not that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We hurt as many sharks as we could making this film. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Which no, I love sharks, but yeah, I, I mean, this isn't how you make films today. Don't go out there and do that. Uh, don't, don't if, if like the dolphins are protecting other dolphins or people from sharks, that means that people were in danger. Uh, from sharks so mm-hmm. again not not uh, best practice for filmmaking the results uh, speak for themselves well and we have to mention too that one shark gets hit on the head with a guitar uh yes which... it does because <laughs> that little <laughs> little pool where the where the subs come into the living room and such and a shark actually pops up i liked that we did get some shark action going into the the underwater house i was glad for that but i definitely was not expecting one of them to get clunked with a guitar yeah, it's always fun to see a shark just kind of peep out in, inside of a home. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't happen in many films. So when it does happen, it's always, hey, that's not something you see every day. But yeah, the um, that's the the drummer hits it with a guitar. I think Marvin, uh, who is my my favorite character, I think he's just, he's just always <laughs> this, this massive grin on his face. Whatever's going on, he's just grinning in the background. <laughs> It's like, I really loved him. He doesn't do anything other than a shark with a guitar. Other than that, he's just like, yeah, great. You're having fun. <laughs> well, having I, de- I definitely want to talk more about the band here in a moment. Uh, but uh, while we're still on the subject of the underwater stuff, let, let's just talk a bit more just kind of the underwater stuff in general. I mean, beyond the, like the shark and the dolphin action, I mean, we get plenty of shots of scuba diving. We get plenty of shots of, uh, you know, the underwater house. There's this other project that's going on where ken barry's character is in this like kind of like underwater bulldozer weird thing (laughs) he's trying to collect gold and such yeah i mean clearly model stuff i did it work for you (laughs) i mean i i didn't i didn't hate it it did did kind of feel like this film's only 63 minutes long we need to add a few a bit more that's had a a rival down there that's had chiva because they don't really that's really pay off a lot it's just it's another obstacle to overcome that's not really tied to the overall but like he <laughs> i did like enjoy the pitch meeting of like there's just gold uh, uh magnesium and, ur- and uranium just lying around on the seabed it's like no there's not uh, <laughs> no <laughs> uranium definitely not um uh, but we've we've developed this thing that's gonna suck it all up and find it and we'll get rich and i, I did like when they, when they were telling tr what about that and all the, the cash register noise in the background He's like gold, ka-ching! uranium, ka-ching! magnesium, ka-ching! like no. <laughs> yeah. um, so and then he picks uh, Jonah Arnold Stang as his uh, sidekick just because his name is Jonah, and he thinks, <laughs> hey, you, someone was named the same thing, and they were in a bit of a whale for a while. This is going to work, and Jonah is useless. <laughs> utterly useless, incompetent fool. Yeah. Uh, uh, like, lets all the air out of on Elton Canisters just by like leaving them open um, and just being an idiot. So I. There's some fun, uh, uh, just like f- physical comedy going on there, and like, he dis- just dismisses Jonah. We never see him again. So <laughs> presumably, yeah, underwater. <laughs> oh, <no>. They're <laughs> three miles away up. from land. It's a long way to <laughs> swim. Uh, and uh, ninety feet down is not like you shouldn't just go straight up from there. No, but this is sixty. They didn't know. Uh, so yeah, so Jonah died. I think it's safe to say Jonah's just never made it home. <laughs> Uh, it's, a, it's a family film. We can't go there. Come on. <laughs> um, and I, I, I enjoyed Chiva. He's like always a bit beleaguered. Uh, he's always like on the phone to TR, and TR's like, "How much gold you got?" He's got like, nothing, no, nothing at all. So it's, it's a fun character. It could have been expanded a bit more, like when, when he goes and steals some of the oxygen from from the from the green onion. It doesn't really pay off at all, other than like, he drops his spanner. Right. And so then when Fred goes there to confront him, he finds Chiva is unconscious and he just saves Chiva. But there's no like confrontation. Like you tried to sabotage my thing. How did you save my life? None of that happens. It's just you know he go- he goes, he drags him back because he's been buried in sand. First time I watched this, and he opens a big pipe and he gets covered in this like brown sludge. And like what is what is that? Like so this is how long have they been down there? Is that all the the waste they've been collecting? 
Mm. Uh, but it's sad. It's sad. Um, and it just it it doesn't really pay off. No. <laughs> the whole cheapest nonsense. Uh, but it's still there's some fun in there. Well, and the whole like device that he's in, the HOD or whatever they called that thing, it, it seems a lot more thrown together <laughs> than the you know the, the Green Onion does. Um, you know, the Green Onion, as we said, has got this real you know kind of fancy look to it and all these conveniences and you know it's this technical achievement and then they just kind of have this thrown together weird underwater vacuum bulldozer thing and you know (laughs) i hate to say it but i got like images in my head of that whole mini sub catastrophe from earlier this year the implosion thing that that was going on you know it's like this does not look safe at all so I, I, I feel like we could expand on a backstory here if we wanted to and, and say, like, Achiever got word of, of Fred's plan and saw that it was being, like, adopted by TR. I was like, I've got to do my own thing. And so he hurriedly finished his ill draft and rushed in to, so he could be the golden boy. He could try and get the promotion. Because, you know, Fred's been given this this kind of ultimatum kind of thing where if, if he and his family will stay down there for 30 days, he becomes head of sales. If mm-hmm. they come back, he's fired. <laughs> which doesn't seem fair, but okay. Uh, so Chief might have heard that and goes, oh, this is my ticket to a promotion. If I can spend 30 days collecting gold, then I'll be head of research or something. And so he's like, rushed it through and it hasn't worked. And he's just trying. He's really trying. And it's just not happening. Well, I was really confused by the jobs of these various people <laughs> to start with. Because like uh, Tony Randall's character, I mean, he created, designed this this underwater house. So he's like, you know, I don't know, some kind of a architect or an engineer. I don't know. But then suddenly that makes him a scuba diving expert, too. And, <laughs> you know, I I, just, I, I wasn't clear on, on exactly what role everybody played in all of this. Plus, not to mention the fact that at the beginning, Tony Randall's telling Janet Lee about you know, all this stuff with the underwater house. And she's like completely shocked like she knows absolutely nothing about his job she she's his wife and she knows nothing about what he does for a living i mean why does she not know tr also doesn't know (laughs) (laughs) his boss doesn't know what's going on at all i think my my favorite quote from the film is anytime somebody explains the house somebody just a response of the water (laughs) it's ludicrous it's insane Uh, as if she has that richard draper says that over the phone i think marshall has it at the one point and yeah, so he like the opening scene in, in the little two man sub going to the like TR's like what where what is this underwater house ridiculous like you've been paying for this yeah like, <laughs> this thing costs they, they say like two hundred thousand dollars I think like that's your money in the sixties that's a lot of money and uh, like you should why aren't you more interested in this <laughs> why haven't you like, been checking the receipts uh, well, this is entirely your fault at this point he just cares about all that uranium you know that's all he wants I did I did get a very deep Lucy vibe from it because like Sam Jackson has no idea about anything when he, he has to have everything explained to him it's you know it's a it's a storytelling device it's, it's weird you know it's to tell us what's going on how much everything costs what everything does i get it but you could write it a little better i guess like, it could be <laughs> explained differently just <laughs> explain it to somebody who generally shouldn't know now, it's could all be being explained to richard Dreyfus's character <laughs> well yes let's <laughs> speak speaking of that yes let, let's move on to uh to the band here because i think one of the strangest things about this film is that you think it's going to be this underwater adventure that it's going to be all about this house of the future underwater and we get scuba diving and sharks and submarines and all that stuff but the story is very quickly hijacked by a 60s pop band that wants to be on the Merv Griffith show. <laughs> and I guess one of the things that is the strangest about this, and again, going back to what I was saying about Disney live action films, one of the things that various of those Disney live action comedies from the, the late 60s, early 70s struggled with was an attempt to make a squeaky clean, family friendly comedy but at the same time, address what was going on with the youth, with the counterculture, with the hippies. And this movie seems to be doing that same thing where it's like, we're going to put this bubblegum pop 60s band in the middle of this stuff and take every single opportunity we can to uh, to have them play their songs and such. And it's just a a weird diversion that kind of overtakes the whole film. So I guess what's your thought on uh, Harold and the hangups here and, and all that's going on on the musical side of this film. Yeah. You're not kidding with every opportunity to play those songs. There are 
Uh, they, they play four different songs in the band. There's also the title song of Hello Down There, which is just the words Hello Down There repeated again and again and again. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the band plays four songs most of them many times. Like the soundtrack is just the, is the, the tune from all of these played again and again and again as well. In their entirety, too. <laughs> yes, it can get a little repetitive. But I, I, I mean, I was surprised when like Tony Randall was like, I, what family are going to take? My family. But to a band playing. So what? What is going on here? And uh, why are they still? And they're still playing, and they're playing again, and the band's coming too. And uh, wait, they're, they're going. They're taking a submarine down here, and it's towing a drum kit. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> uh, for sure. I liked them. I thought Rich Dreyfus needs to work on uh, trying to look like he's actually singing uh, these songs and not uh, having. The voice doesn't sound anything like what you would imagine Richard Dreyfus' singing voice sounds like. Yeah, not not in the slightest. The songs are fine. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna add them to an iTunes playlist anytime soon. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I'd like that he he writes the uh, Dreyfus character writes the entirety of Hey Little Goldfish in a matter of seconds, uh, just by like seeing a goldfish and they, hey guys, just follow me, play this, yeah, and he just, yeah, just, just sings the song. Do what I do, yeah. <laughs> Which, I mean, my, one of my favorite podcasts is Off Book, which is an improvised musical podcast. They write a whole, they improvise a whole musical every week, or they did. The podcast has since ended, uh, but I still love it. And so people can do that, but I sense his character can't. That's, it's, you know, I, don't, I don't buy that. From See, Harold. I've always yeah. struggled with that a little bit, because it happens in movies a lot. Heck, Marty McFly does it in <laughs> Back to the Future. But I've always thought, how do you make a song that sounds like it's, you know, right off of the uh, off the album, you know, perfectly recorded and all that, on the spot there at the Fish Under the Sea dance? Yeah, it, it, I'm not buying that. How, how do the rest of the band know when to come in with the oohs and another, <laughs> like, what, and they just know where you're going with the guitar and the, yeah, okay, I get it, fine. I guess you've been working together for a while. You've got good chemistry. You all live in the same bubble. Uh, I get it. Fine. My my main stand up for, for Dreyfus is that red outfit he's wearing at one point is very odd and not not what I would pack to live on the water for a month. But you <laughs> did. So well, what did you think of the songs? While you're talking about the fashion, there I will say all of Richard Dreyfus's outfits in this are strange and not at all what I would have expect Richard Dreyfus to ever wear. <laughs> but that's that's beside the point. Yeah, the songs are goofy i mean they do have a little bit of charm to them i admit i do have a bit of a soft spot for 60s bubblegum pop type of songs uh i'm not gonna say these are terribly good you know they're all right the, the hey little goldfish song sounds like a song that like the group the love and spoonful would do um okay and then uh the the one that's just called like glub <laughs> that's, that's weird <laughs> uh, i guess the songs though were actually written by a a pretty well-known songwriter is a guy named jeff barry, jeff barry. Yeah. and like i was looking through songs that he's written and i mean first one of the things that stood out and definitely kind of ties into this movie he was the guy that kind of supervised the creation of the music for the animated show the archies back around this same time so like the song sugar sugar he wrote that and you know the idea that you just have this band tagging along is very much like what you have in a show like the Archies or some of those other shows where just, you know, everybody had a band type of a thing. But Jeff Berry, he wrote do wah diddy diddy and then he kissed me and chapel of love and leader of the pack and this guy wrote a lot of iconic songs river deep mountain high yeah you know <laughs> these are definitely not iconic songs these are these are weird little earworms and i think you know if i had heard them once in the movie i would have liked them more than uh you know the fact that we hear them like four times each in the movie yeah, and like that's, there's at one point where the band gets they go on a little detour in a submarine to go and try and be on the Merv Griffin show, and the, they get stuck and they're trapped. And so what do they do? They play a song. They play one of their songs again because they're trapped in a little submarine. They can't do anything. Hey, let's play a song. Let's start drumming on the dashboard. Right. Like, <laughs> it's, if you leave them alone for three minutes, they will start playing a, a song. That's all they all they do. Which you know, I I have known some aspiring musicians. That's actually true. That's yeah. what happens. Like, oh yeah. If, if you put like you could be sat if it's like four of you in a room, three of you having a conversation, and as a musician who's feeling a bit of doubt, they will start playing a song. That's what I mean. I've yeah. experienced that happen. It's actually quite irritating. My brother is that way. My my brother is a musician, uh, and he always you know had drumsticks in his pocket, and he just start banging on things, you know. And yes, it can get very annoying. <laughs> I love my brother. He's talented, but you know, come on. <laughs> 
Well, it, th- these these four teenagers, which I mean, I say teenagers in air quotes <laughs> because <laughs> they look pretty old for teenagers. I kept on wanting them to be a little bit quirkier to have a bit more to their characters they're just kind of there to play music all the time i mean there is some fun stuff like you mentioned marvin marvin's a little weird and and i i could get behind that but i mean like a lot of aspects of this movie there are seeds that are planted that are never fulfilled like you know when when they first propose taking the rest of the band members down with them under the water, uh, the daughter says something like, well, okay, but if Harold breaks off the engagement, then, you know, I'm going to be upset. And they're like, engagement? What engagement? And then there's like no other hint that there's a romance going on between them. No, yeah, you're right. That's I, I forgot about that. Yeah. And like, I feel like that they, there's very little character to Tommy and Laurie, to Fred and Vivian's kids. Whatever... Like Fred wants to do anything, he addresses Harold. He goes to Dreyfus. Yeah. And like he, yeah, you know, he goes to like we need to keep the keep the women from getting too emotional. Like help me <laughs> help me with this. Like, yeah. Jesus, come on. Uh, um, uh, but yeah, he always like employs Dreyfus to help him out rather than his own son. Right. When the sharks <laughs> attack, he he's like you know get get everybody into the sub. But Harold, you come with me. We're gonna go battle the sharks or whatever. Which you know I like to think I, I'm go like okay in in the alternate universe of my head. After this experience was all done, Harold changed his name to Matt Hooper. And, you know, then, you know, he, because of this whole experience, he was, uh, you know, enthralled with sharks. And, and there we go. I thought you were going to go with, I built up in the universe of your head. Uh, Fred was trying to get Harold to be eaten by a shark. Uh, like, so trying, to, trying to end that engagement. He's like, you're not good enough for my daughter. Here, shark chum. <laughs> that would have been good, too. <laughs> well, I, and before we move off the band, too, I want to talk about one of my favorite aspects of this film. Uh, I mean, we've got a lot of things going on here, a lot of characters, a lot of things where there's hints of something interesting that doesn't pan out. But uh, for me, the best part about this movie was Roddy McDowell. <laughs> because I just I, think I thought it would so be. You weird. love Roddy McDowell. I do. I love Roddy McDowell, uh, but he's just so weird in this. And it's another kind of example of what we were talking about, where they're trying to tap into that whole youth culture of the 60s thing. Uh, I mean, just to start with, his character is named Nate Ashbury instead of hate Ashbury, as in where the hippies hung out in San Francisco. But just, you know, the weird outfits that Roddy McDowell is playing, the way he sees himself as this, like, wonder boy record producer, which it's weird they keep referring to him like he's a teenager. Roddy McDowell was 41 when he made this movie. (laughs) I I mean, Dreyfus was 22. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, like, it's just such a bizarre part. And I'm looking at things going, Roddy McDowell turned down being in Beneath the Planet of the Apes and was in this instead in 1969. Oh, uh, his Beneath the one I really liked. Beneath is the one with the with the bomb where they all worship the bomb. Yeah, Beneath is my favorite one. Uh, it's a spoiler for Beneath the Planet of the Apes. They blow up the world. And, <laughs> and for it to be the second film in a franchise where they blow up the world and you know there's three more films coming. When we covered those in the Lamb Cost many years ago, I was like, where is this franchise going? They just blew up the planet. <laughs> there's three more films coming. And it's time travel. Uh, so great. Um, I, I, I couldn't believe when that happened when I watched that film. So yes, like, what... I didn't realize he wasn't he wasn't in that one. What a fool. Uh, he yep. missed out on being the best film of the franchise. <laughs> yeah, somebody else plays Cordelius in that one. Uh, yeah, I, I, I enjoyed... Like, he brought a different kind of flavor to the film, uh, he and, and Lee Meredith, for just this, like, anarchic, wanderkind uh, uh, producer just on a different planet uh, yeah. to everyone else. <laughs> so, and just at that big data machine that, uh, that Dr. Wells has, like, that analyzes how popular a song's going to be. <laughs> like, this is going to outsell everything we've ever done because the machine has now broken. That's how good the song is. <laughs> well, and that whole aspect of things was weird too because I guess in my mind, if you're you know all about the hippie culture and whatnot, you would have been like, hey, man, the dollars don't matter, you know, just just you be you and all that. But instead, they're running everything through this computer to see what's going to sell. And I'm going, wait, you know, like he, he, he dresses like he's in the 1960s, but now suddenly they're in the 1980s analyzing all the data and seeing what's going to sell big. 
yeah, he, it's. I mean, I've, he's just kind of capitalizing on on the hippie movement, kind of, isn't, isn't he? Like, because he makes fun of them. He says, like, if there's anything these kids can do, they can grow hair. So he, <laughs> yeah. he knows. <laughs> Very unusual thing to say, uh, but he, like, he he knows exactly who his like market is and who his his suppliers are, I guess, the, the musicians. But he's not he's not in it for that. He's in it for the money. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, which is, you know, he's a music producer. That checks out. Uh, <laughs> well, I feel like we kind of skipped over the big stars of this film. We went right to the band. Um, we should talk a bit about Tony Randall and Janet Lee. Uh, what do you think of what they're providing here? Uh, I, I feel like uh, not being very familiar with Tony Randall, he felt very much like a regular 60s, 70s sitcom dad role. Like yep. his name should be Darren and something. Well, the, uh, and... the year after this, he he began a long run uh, on the Odd Couple TV series, so he's definitely a TV guy. I regret to say I didn't look up where I might have seen him from before, so I'm kind of looking now, and I don't think I've seen him in anything. <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, he was he was a, a, he was in a cameraman in Hitchcock's Saboteur, but uncredited. So <laughs> that's his, his first role, and then did nothing for 15 years. Uh, so maybe I, I should check that out again, see if I can spot him. He voiced the he voiced the brain gremlin. Oh yeah, oh, should, yeah, he I is the brain gremlin. <laughs> oh dear, uh, yeah. So I, I that makes sense. Though. I'm glad that he I, I sussed out. He's a sitcom dad, and he was a sitcom dad. Which makes me feel good. Uh, so I, I think he does great anytime he's not singing. Uh, that scene where oh, he, he's yeah. he's oh. singing just one more chance uh, with all the animals swimming away. I wanted to do the same thing. Uh, I. I, I <laughs> No, thank you. Very bad. And I, I like, he's he's now singing a song to try and woo back Vivian and like sing something that he and the wife can enjoy. And um, the rest of the band are not happy about it. Everybody looks at Draper. Draper is like a, like a little grumpy cat uh, playing the guitar. <laughs> and he puts on a fake smile and he goes back to being grumpy again. Yeah, he, he's he's fine. Like, he doesn't do anything. He doesn't shine for me, but he you know he fits the role exactly. And mm-hmm. the same for, for, for Vivian Vivian Lee. That's Janet Lee, sorry, playing Vivian. Vivian Janet, a different yeah. person. Uh, yes, um, I think she she was fine, but she wasn't given an awful lot to do other than overreact to some stuff. I feel like she was maybe uh, over or under directed at times. Where she's like, just just play this big, like there's washing machines exploded, go nuts. Right. Yeah, uh, there's there's an alarm going off, fall in the water. She's it's like it's antics. She's told to. There's, there's not a lot of depth to her character. I agree. In fact, I think Janet Lee is the one who seems the most out of place here. And maybe part of that is because, again, going back to that kind of that 60s sitcom feel of things, a lot of the other folks in this movie are folks I associate with television. You know, Tony Randall, Jim Backus was from Gilligan's Island. Uh, You know, uh, Ken Berry uh, was on F Troop and Mayberry RFD. He's been on lots of shows. Even Arnold Stang, he was the voice of Top Cat on TV. What? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, all these people are TV folks in my mind. And then you have Marion from Psycho in there. And it's almost like Janet Lee kind of feels like, what what am I doing in this movie? (laughs) Why is there an actress in this film? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's that's, that's fair because uh, this is yeah, this is after Psycho, it's like nine years after Psycho. So, nine years, I mean, I, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I, I've not assessed her career. Was she on a down slope at this point? Mm, uh, I don't know. I don't know. She'd done like two episodes of Man from Uncle and Theater of the Stars. Uh, I don't know. It was it was a uh, like, yeah, almost a decade from Psycho, so maybe she wasn't at her peak. Uh, but then maybe she wanted to have fun. Maybe she wanted to do a, a, a fun, quirky little Tony, Tony Randall film. I got to mention, too, while we're talking about cast members and especially those that have uh, kind of more history with television, I got to throw out uh, Charlotte Ray being in this, playing the, the weird kind of loopy, the drunken maid. semi-alcoholic <laughs> housekeeper, which, you know, is a weird big performance that she's given there. Um, but it was funny to me because here she is playing this kind of crazy housekeeper and the role that Charlotte Ray is most known for, for people of my generation is she was Mrs. Garrett on the show, different strokes where she was the housekeeper. And then that spun off onto the show facts of life. And she became you know a bit less kind of crazy and loopy uh, as those series went on. But uh, I always got to think of her as a crazy housekeeper. (laughs) And so to see her in this as the crazy housekeeper at alcohol was, was kind of fun. (laughs) Yeah. She's another one with, with big sitcom energy. So she, she's playing to the back seats at times uh, with with some of her reactions. And she's not even trying to hide that she has a drinking problem. 
No. She offers the drink to her boss. <laughs> to, like, to, like, oh, you seem worried, Mr. Miller. Would you like a drink? <laughs> like, so, so, so my tonic has a big swig of it while she's supposed to be working. Uh, so, yeah, not even, not even trying to hide it. Is drunk the entirety of the film, I think. And then uh, is, is dancing with Cheever at the end. And yeah. like she seems less into it than he does. Uh, so, <laughs> It's great. I, I am unfamiliar with her as an actress, but I, I liked everything she did here. Uh, so, I, yeah, I'm going to check out some of her other work. And I, I in that kind of role, uh, um, kind of category, uh, Jim Backus as, oh. as TR was also uh, very entertaining. <laughs> you know, we've seen this role a thousand times where it's just he's the boss who's grumpy all the time. Right. And he he fits it to a T. He brings a lot of, uh, just a lot of, character to it, a lot of entertainment, a lot of funny line readings, and he does a lot of voiceover work and yeah. I can see. Well, I uh, mean, he's he's almost playing the role he's most famous for in this. He, he's most famous as being Thurston Howell on uh, on Gilligan's Island, the millionaire, and he's kind of playing the same part here. He, you know, he's he got dollar signs in his eyes, and that's about all there is to him. But, but he does it well. It's, it's always fun. Like, hey, it's him again. It, it would never like he, he keeps on cropping up on the phone, so it's it's good that they they pepper him throughout the film. So we're never we're never too far away from a Jim Backus uh, telling someone they're an idiot. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, Give me more gold. How much gold you got? I need some more gold. <laughs> always, always. That's well, let's talk real quick about the ending. Like you said, the movie kind of you said it has no ending, <laughs> which I was I was. So- I was, yeah, I was frustrated with that too because there's all this lead up to you think that the the navy's going to come in and and attack which uh, again uh, the, the the navy has an actor who I love seeing show up in there, Harvey Lembeck. Uh you know, I I I'm a big fan of the old beach party movies. Harvey Lembeck shows up in there as Eric Von Zipper all the time. Um and he's in lots of other stuff too. He's in uh Stalag 17, you know, he's, he's a great actor. Um, and so, you know, having the Navy with Harvey Lembeck there, I was like, oh, okay, they're going to barge in at the end and, and there's going to be this thing. But no, <laughs> it just ends. They play a song on the Merv Griffin show and that's that. See, it's, it's the fact that they have all this footage of like, every time the, the band starts playing a song, whether they're in the Green Onion or in a submarine, as long as they're underwater, doesn't matter where they are, the, the sonar guy, Harvey Lembeck, Picks up on his on his phone. That's some kind of secret weapon down there. We don't have a weapon. It's the enemy. Uh, so they they the entire naval fleet. There's there's planes. There's boats. There's parachutes. There's divers. All brought out and all engaged and go and we're heading towards you. Credits. <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to do? <laughs> oh, I mean, yes, we we can imagine what they they invade, they attack, they all dance on the Merv Griffin show. I don't know, but like. Why would you set so much up and then not pay it off? I don't get it. I don't understand. It's so frustrating. <laughs> the studio was just like, nope, nope, that's enough. We've run out of budget money. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> Play a song you, and roll the credits. You may make exactly 97 minutes of film, not a second more. <laughs> uh, what is that? Okay. And I don't know. Like, they could have just not had the whole, that whole pay off to anything. There's no interaction between the Navy and... But maybe that's why. Maybe they filmed the whole film and were like, huh. It, like I said earlier, they, 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 it was a short running time. So I had to add in like five minutes of extra footage. And so there's no one in on the boat no, has any interaction I... with anybody in the Onions. They could have just all been filmed entirely separately. You're right. And that's what it feels like to me. Just like we have, we have this footage from a different film where there's someone's <laughs> hearing something underwater. <laughs> That film's gone under. Let's just chuck it into Hello Down There and claim it as a tax rebate. Yeah, I don't know. Can we call somebody who's available to play a, play a radar technician? I got Harvey Lembeck over here. Lembeck will work. Bring him in. Done. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Well, do you have anything uh, anything else before we take to the break? Uh, just scanning through my my notes. Uh, I mean, we, we skipped over TR lighting a cigar in an oxygen rich environment in the in the submarine and setting fire to everything. Uh, it's good. We didn't talk much about the seal. That is the seal. She's uh, fun. Yeah, the, <laughs> I, the, the seal was kind of like, I don't know. I'm like, you got two happy-go-lucky dolphins there. Do we really need a seal, too? And he's like, all right. It doesn't get in the way too much. It sits there and watches the laundry. <laughs> so, and, and like, she, She's an aquaphobe with a pet seal. I explain that. And just how aquaphobic is Vivian when she can live in an underwater house with a big pool in the middle? I don't think she's that aquaphobic. 
I did like the gimmick that she carries around an inner tube half the time. <laughs> and there's the, the picture of her on, on the beach, on sand on the beach, holding two of them. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, and I, yeah, you're not going to need that. I know I'm going back home. It's, it's a nice moment. And oh, when when the band are all need to go and, and uh, be on the Mercury show, so like, Harold can ride, drive a motorbike, therefore he can pilot a submarine. It's smaller, so it's easier. Uh, it was great. <laughs> hey, it's not smaller. That submarine is bigger than a motorbike, for one thing. <laughs> uh, but the fact that I, I liked that he then couldn't. He tried and failed and grounded them. Uh, so that was nice. Um, uh, but yeah, I, 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 overall, I liked this film. I, I, I'm glad that this of the options selected, this is the one that I could find. This is the one that we watched. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's it's um, it's a film that again I'm not going to sit here and say this is great filmmaking. This is very much kind of a a television level type production, but I'd also put it under the goofy fun type of category. You know, it, it's also kind of one of those movies that you watch and you go, "Wow, I kind of don't believe that this exists." <laughs> you know, this is just who came up with this? I'm glad that they did, but wow, what universe am I in? Yeah, it, I mean, I'm happy it does, uh, but it's, this is very much a forgotten film, uh, and I can kind of see why, just because of that lack of an ending. <laughs> but, but the fact that I, I think only like 360 people have logged this on Letterboxd, that feels so low. I'm, I'm sure you have lower. I, I have lower. Uh, yeah. But th- like, this, that just feels like none at all. And like, there's so many people who just don't know. I, I don't think it's ever had a, a UK release on any kind of physical media. I had to find it via ulterior motives. Oh. Uh, but it's I mean it's, it's on the internet archive somewhere uh, so thank you to the runners of that but it's it's like so hard to find this needs a re-release this needs a blu-ray this needs a uh, 4k <laughs> hello down the criterion collection does it need a remake I mean hey you could take half the cast of Deep Blue Sea and put them in this one you know you absolutely could get LL uh, Cool J down there with a bird. I mean, that's that's I mean, gold, right? He already sings. He already sings. I, I don't. <laughs> think, instead of a sixties bubble cop, cast would do it. <laughs> instead of a sixties uh, bubblegum pop band, they're a, they're now a rap <laughs> act. <laughs> so what you'd have like Thomas Jane and uh, Saffron Burrows as as Fred and Vivian, uh, <laughs> LL Cool J and Michael Rappaport uh, as yeah, LL Cool J as Dreyfus. Uh, Michael Rappaport as uh, as Marvin. As Marvin, yeah. Um, you'd have uh, 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 oh, Janice. Well, I can't remember. I, um, this is terrible. Uh, McAllister. No, nope, that's oh god, I can't remember the cast of Deep Blue Sea. This is terrible. It's not like I've done <laughs> 150 episodes on this podcast. Uh, Jacqueline McKenzie. I got there eventually. It would be Laurie and uh, oh, well, Stellan Skarsgård is going to have to be Richard Dreyfus because he's her partner in that, and then uh, he can just be another brother. Uh, and Sam Jackson will be Tia. There we go. He's yeah. up. Or he's yelling at them over the phone. And put uh, put Simon Cowell in there for Merv Griffin, and they can end up being on America's Got Talent or whatever, something like that. Uh, okay, I'd rather it be like Jimmy Fallon or something, just someone who <laughs> like, can be entertaining and not everyone's cup of tea. But Simon Cowell cannot be entertaining. <laughs> he's he's not, not a funny guy. Um, Jimmy Fallon uh, would probably be all over this, no doubt. I just make it the Jimmy Fallon show. Everything about it is me, and they occasionally cut to underwater. That's cool. <laughs> Ida uh, Satoro would be the um, the Charlotte Ray character. There we go. Just so she's in there as well. And we, we need a silent Ronnie Cox somewhere. I mean, has Ronnie Cox passed? Is he still with us? I can't remember. Uh, Ronnie Cox still alive, so he can still be in there somewhere. What's a silent character in this? Um, uh, there are. He could be the dolphin. Uh, <laughs> the dolphin. <laughs> And the cast of Deep Sea 2 can be cheaper. There we go. And that was our discussion on, on Hello Down There. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, of course, we have to do a different outro because this is the Deep Sea, Deep Sea the podcast. So we need to let you know, uh, how is this film similar to Deep Blue Sea? And as I said earlier, it's it's quite similar. Hello Down There had far more similarities than I, than I thought. In that It wasn't until after I watched it that I thought, hey, we should do this on Deep Blue Sea. Uh, so, nice long list. Uh, underwater living quarters. Very straightforward. Uh, an yeah. experiment. Yeah. Ex- Experiment that needs immediate approval from the higher ups. Mm -hmm. Uh, Songs sung by cast member. No LL Cool J, but (laughs) others. Uh, There's an open water pool in an underwater room, which I I always always puts me on edge. Like, what is this? Isn't going to go well. Like, there's water out there, and also there that I can touch. I don't like it. 
Yeah, but it's that. It's in the living room. Hang on, Jay. I got to jump back, though, a minute. You said songs sung by cast member. Yes. Uh, I think it's a stretch to say that that's Richard Dreyfuss singing, you know. I that's mean, true. I'm... Is it is it Tony Randall <laughs> singing when he has his song? Oh, okay, I yeah, sure. I, I think that one, it, you are right okay. on that one. Yeah. Yes. I'll allow it. Good. I mean, L.O. Cool doesn't sing in the film. He sings over the end credits. So it's it's a tenuous one. Uh, right. there, there's a scene with a shark looking in the window, which is not from Deep Sea. It's from Deep Sea 2. Uh, that still counts, which you haven't seen Deep Sea 2. Uh, which you, you, I have you not. See. But that that there is a scene where uh, a character is plotting something, and there's a shark in the window, understanding what's going on, and it's delightful. Uh, so, uh, the character of Jonah, Arnold Stang's character, uh, gave me real Scoggins energy. I felt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I feel like that's uh, no offense to Michael Rappaport and to Scoggins, but I got the real Scoggins, Scoggins vibe from Jonah. Uh, there is a character riding on a sea creature's fin. It's a dolphin rather than a shark. Uh, but it, hey, counts. Yes. Uh, we see a shark's feeding time. It's unintentional in this film, but it, it, we see it. Uh, there are three sharks predominantly in the shark scene. And there are three sharks in deep sea. There is a floating device to draw the sharks away when, uh, when Tarter mm-hmm. makes a little um, um, fire extinguisher life jacket combo to draw the sharks away, which succeeds. Uh, there are sharks appearing in the dive pool. Uh, it's not like still swimming with sharks. Uh, Counting a number from a data readout happens at one point, <laughs> which happens in Deep Blue Sea when they do the experiment. <laughs> and in this one, when uh, uh, Roddy McDowell and, and Lee Meredith get there, there's 1.27, 1.27, they, st- they dance around chanting 1.27, which I think that's the first time that's come mm-hmm. up with a similarity. So, like that. There's an incoming storm, which, as we discuss all the time, there's always an incoming storm. Every film has an incoming storm, but it's always going to point it out. There's an incoming yes. storm. Uh, uh, Chiva's communications go down, and he uses a wrench at one point. Both of these happen in Deep Sea. Uh, there is a, a mm-hmm. leak springs in one of the in one of the things, one of the underwater uh, things. They're opening a wheel lock door at one point. There's a collapsing underwater facility, suiting up in a wetsuit. An out of action submersible, and characters film themselves underwater. Preacher films his own little monologue kind of thing, and then they film a whole episode of the Murph Griffith show underwater. So that's. <laughs> so, <laughs> they don't do that in deep. They don't film a Merv. How unusual would it be if Merv Griffin showed up in Aquatica? Like, hey, I'm here to film uh, Preacher's Omnia and speak. That would be unusual. Yeah. Uh, but he shows up in this. I show. want to interview the sharks, you know? Come yeah. on. <laughs> the scientists who made these sharks were intelligent. What were you thinking? It's the question I have. What are you doing? <laughs> um, so that, that's my deep blue sea similarities list. But we have one other feature to do, which is how that's deep... a that's a big list. That's I, I'm impressed. Yeah. Like, far more than I thought this film would have. I thought it was just going to be like, hey, it's a you know, it's a family living underwater for a bit. What what, what could be similar? But a lot. Uh, but we need to know how deep and how blue is Hello down there. So Todd, as I'm sure you know, deep blue sea is about forty-seven and a half feet deep, and 31% blue. Do you think Hello Down There is on average deeper and or bluer than Deep Blue Sea? Well... It's a tough one. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm thinking... I'm thinking... It may, how deep did you say blue, Deep Blue Sea was again? 47 and a half feet on average, but 14 and a half meters. 47 and a half feet... Well, don't they? I, I'm pretty sure they say several times in "Hello down there" that they're 90 feet deep. Yes. So yes, I think they're deeper. Um, I mean, the blue. I've always struggled with how you rate the blue because I'm like, well, what shade of blue are we talking about? Sure. Here? I mean, this gets pretty blue. <laughs> it gets pretty blue down there, but um, I know this is a light blue. So yeah, I, I, mean, I think maybe I will say it's more blue as well. You are correct on both counts. Uh, it's unusual, but well done. Uh, so yes, they say they're at ninety feet deep, which is about twenty-seven and a half meters uh, deep. Uh, but they're not down there the whole time. So there are other times when they're up on the on land or on the surface, and up in the mm. the navy ships and in planes and things. Uh, so on average, this works out of being fifty-nine point seven feet deep, or eighteen point two meters. So deeper, uh, which means it's slightly deeper than forty-seven meters down uncaged. Uh, because they're they're rarely forty seven meters down in that film, it's a lie. Uh, but mm. less deep than Deep Blue Sea too. Uh, so this is actually only two away from <laughs> Deep Blue Sea. It goes Deep Blue Sea forty seven meters down on Cage. Hello down there, 
Deep Sea Two. So uh, that's that's good. Wow. Your sixteenth, our sixteenth deepest film out of uh, eighty six at this point. So that's a good score. Wow, excellent. Uh, blue. Yeah. That's quite a blue film. Forty five point six zero nine percent blue, and I've had to go that accurate because at forty five point six zero eight. We have Jaws the Revenge, which you were on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, so you have both the uh, the eleventh and the twelfth bluest spots on 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 our on our spreadsheet. Uh, so slightly blue. Wow, I range. think I'm doing pretty good here. <laughs> and slightly less blue than forty seven meters down uncaged again. So forty five point seven seven. It's right. It's a popular area that forty five point six and seven. But yeah, that's that's. I, I haven't worked out actually who our deepest and bluest guests have been. <laughs> that would be fun, uh, but yeah, our, our deepest is still forty centimeters down, which was Jess. Uh, bluest is underwater, which I think was Matt. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, you're doing well. It's me. It's totally me. I, I'm going to own it this. Is. I think it is. Uh, I will have to. I have to check. Well, well, Jess has got forty seven meters down and forty seven meters down uncaged, so she's she's got two that are above you. But where does? But then she also has sphere. And spears down at twenty nine point two, so that's going to drag her average down. But then you have the you have the Poseidon Adventures, which aren't terribly blue films. Yes. So I think your average might have been <laughs> brought down a little bit. Uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to see. We'll have to see. But either way, uh, it's it's I've deeper got, and it's I've better. got Hackman though. So you do. Yes, always always great to have Hackman and Kane. You have two Canes. And yes. I think I said on the other podcast that I have I have plans for you in terms of Michael Kane films, and. Uh, Michael oh. Caine is in a, a poorly reviewed sequel that's pretty deep, I believe, because uh, Michael Caine is, of course, in oh, I'm hit load, in, of course, in the sequel to Journey to the Center of the Earth. He's in Journey to the Mysterious Island in 2012. Oh yeah. So I feel oh, like yeah. that film might be in your future. <laughs> Ooh, bring it we on! I'm down for anything. Josh Hutchison, uh, uh, Dwayne the Rock Johnson, Louise Guzman, Vanessa Hudgens. We'll see them all in this film. That does it go deep? I don't know. Is it an island rather than underwater? We'll find out at some point in the future. Uh, but that's that's that's. Hello down there. Uh, thank you for uh, recording this intro and outro with me, Todd. I appreciate it. Do you have anything you wish to plug? Oh, always. Uh, so yeah, if you want to check out my podcast, the Forgotten Film Cast, uh, you can find that on all the uh, various places you get podcasts. Uh, I also have a blog that's called Forgotten Films. It's at ForgottenFilmCast.wordpress.com. And you can follow me on X, the artist formerly known as Twitter, at Forgotten Films. That's Films with a Z. Fantastic. And I, I strongly encourage everyone to go and listen to that Forgotten Filmcast episode on Hello Down There, because there is a whole different opening conversation. And then there's movie recommendations at the end. And you should go back and check them both out. Uh, so that will already been released Absolutely. a couple of days ago when this episode comes out. And thank you, Todd, for editing that main section as well. Much appreciated. Uh, oh, thank you for being a guest, and and I think it's <laughs> it's awesome that uh, we can uh, we can work together, podcasts changing the world together. <laughs> One happy, podcast happy at a time. Happy to do so. Uh, great. Uh, well, as for me, you can find everything I do at lifevsfilm.com or uh, this is a film on Twitter, X, whatever, and uh, J A Y C L U I T on Instagram and Jake Lewis. And uh, you can find this podcast all over social media at Deep Blue Sea Pod and find everything Mark does over at movies, films, and flicks.com. Uh, so today's episode was supposed, I've said on the last week's episode, today was, was going to be the Little Mermaid remake. We'll now get that in two weeks because this cross promotion opportunity came up, so it's going to bump the schedule a little bit. That's fine. We've already recorded the episode with Audrey Fox. Excellent show. You should look forward to that one. Uh, but next week is going to be the only remaining Rennie Harlan Christmas film. It's Happy Harlan Days, of course, in December. Uh, Bodies at Rest, a film he made in his uh, China period, uh, which is kind of, it's, it's yeah. Die Hard in a Hospital, sort of. Uh, Bodies at Rest, a great, actually a very good film. I strongly recommend people go and find it. It's online. It's on Daily Motion, I think. We had much fun with this release. So check out Bodies at Rest next week, and then the week after that will be Little Mermaid. So, fun films coming up soon on DBC the podcast. But as for me, thank you once again to my guest, my guest, to my host for most of this, Todd Liebenau. <laughs> it was a pleasure. Thank you. 
I've been Jay Clure and I'll deep blue see you next week.